How do you want to do this? 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 Perhaps one of Matthew Mercer's most iconic lines. A seemingly simple line, but one that holds a lot of weight, both with his players and with fans of the show. At its core, it's a really simple concept. At the very end of a combat, when the last blow is about to fall, Matt yields some narrative control to his players, allowing them to describe exactly how that final blow happens. Mechanically, nothing changes, but players get an extra bit of control over the narrative at a critical moment of high emotion. Today, we're going to take that concept past the last blow of the fight and look at what that how do you want to do this might look like if it was applied to loot, to the treasure that the players find after that combat. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that you say, hey, you open the treasure chest and now what do you find inside? That could lead to some potentially game-breaking consequences. That's not what I'm talking about. These are five ways that you can yield some of that narrative control to your players while they're looting that won't break your game and will actually improve your story. Let's jump right in with number one. The first method is actually the simplest. Instead of coming up with detailed descriptions of every magic item your players find, occasionally give them the chance to just describe it themselves. This works best when the players already know what the magic item does. So if you adhere really closely to the uh, rules for identifying magic items, then this might not be for you, but it's really easy to implement if your players already know that they've got, say, a plus one sword. Instead of going into a ton of detail about the type of metal it's made from and the shape of the hilt and the gemstone that's embedded at the base of the blade and the runes that are inscribed along the blade itself, let the players come up with their own description. One of the cool things about giving players narrative control is that a lot of times you can mine their ideas for future story hooks. So say you give out this plus one sword, and in your head it looks one way, but in your player's mind, the one who's describing it, it has some visual cues that make you think, oh, maybe this was created by dwarves. And maybe your campaign hasn't featured dwarves very heavily. But at this point, now you have a good story hook to maybe bring in some dwarven lore. Or come up with some dwarven lore that you've never really had to consider before. I can see a DM using this technique when they maybe haven't had enough time to prepare the treasure that their players are about to find. And instead of just saying, oh wow, you found a plus one sword, you get to yield some of that narrative control. You get all the benefits that come from yielding that control. And that magic item that you didn't have time to write a description for now looks really cool and isn't just a very vague magic item in the pot. I don't know why it would be in a pot. I'm not sure where that came from. In your party's list of loot. If you don't like that technique and you don't think it would fit the lore of your setting, but you still like the idea of players describing magic items and, and giving them some amount of control, technique number two might be just for you. And that is including some type of magic item or group of magic items in your campaign, in the lore of your setting, where the magic items themselves over time come to resemble or reflect the aesthetics of their owners. So for example, that plus one sword that may have been wielded by a big bad in your early campaign and maybe had some like super evil vibes to it. Once you've players have taken it and have started using it and have been using it for a time, you can ask them, okay, it used to look like this because it was being wielded by the villain, but over time you start to see some physical changes, not in the way the item works, but in the way it looks and presents itself that better reflect that you are the one that is using it rather than the villain that you already defeated. This is kind of a throwback to the idea that magical armor resizes so that it fits a new wearer when they put it on, even if they didn't match the body type of the last person who was wearing it. But it takes that idea a step further and lets players get really creative with how their equipment appears. By the way, if you happen to be new here, I am Josh. This is Copper Dragon Games, and on this channel, we do talk about Dungeons and & Dragons, and often virtual tabletop resources.
If you're finding these tips useful and you want more of them in the future, I want to encourage you to click the subscribe button, like the video, throw some comments below, all that good stuff. Join the conversation, pump me up in the old YouTube algorithm, and let's get back to the D&D stuff. The third technique that we're going to talk about is one that I've seen implemented in-game and one that I've actually used occasionally myself in the 20-something odd years that I've been DMing. And that's asking your players for a magic item wish list at the beginning of the campaign or, or even mid-campaign if you're checking in with them and asking for feedback. This is really easy to do and a lot of players already have in mind some magic items that they would love for their characters to have. And this gives you an easy opportunity to fine-tune the treasure hoards that you are placing over the course of your campaign to meet your players' wishes. Or if your players ask for things that are overpowered, you can just not give it to them or just let them know that it's off the table. Maybe you don't want the randomness of a deck of many things in your campaign. Maybe that's too much for you and your players ask for it and you just say, hey, you know what? Maybe pick a different one instead of that. That one, not in my game. I did mention earlier in the video that none of these ideas would break your campaign or break the game balance of your campaign. If you use suggestion number three and you still want that to be true, you do have to hold to it when you say, no, I'm not going to give X, Y, or Z treasure out during the campaign. It's also a good idea to ask your players to give you a range of rarities for the magic items on their wish list because you don't want to ask a player for a wish list and then every single item they ask for is legendary. If that is what they give you, you'll either be delaying those rewards for a really long time or giving them things at really low level that they're not really supposed to have at that low of a level. Number four is actually my favorite, and it's the reason that I was inspired to make this video in the first place. And that is having a set of undefined treasure within every big hoard that you haven't detailed that you just give players the opportunity to detail themselves if they choose to. Lately, I've been putting together the Handy Horde of Treasure series, which is a group of drive through RPG supplements that helps DMs come up with really interesting and customized treasures for their dragons in this case. Each of these supplements gives you a creature that would have a treasure hoard, gives you some plot hooks to get your players to interact with said creature, and then the details of the treasure hoard itself, including homebrew magic items that you won't find anywhere else. You can find these on drive through RPG. I've got some links in the description below. Or if you're one of my patrons, you'll get them automatically as a part of your patronage. And while we're talking about the Patreon, I want to take a moment to go ahead and thank those who have already joined. I really appreciate your support of the channel, and I can't wait to use the funds from that patronage to improve things even more. Now back to the D&D stuff. The piece that inspired me to do this video is probably the least interesting part of these supplements, and that is this simple line at the end of the list of valuables. An assortment of less valuable art and gems worth 500 gold pieces combined. Now, I've been including this in my own campaigns for a long period of time. It's a really easy way to incorporate a lot of, say, smaller gemstones without having to detail every single 10 GP uh, common gem that's in a big bag that they may find on one of the bad guys. Say you have a player who's been looking for a gold ring but you didn't have a gold ring that you specifically put in that dragon hoard. All of a sudden, you have a bag of less valuable items that the player can just say, you know what, I'm pretty sure there's a gold ring in there, right? And you get to say, sure, there's a gold ring. What do you do with it? You do have to be careful with giving players uh, too much of this undefined treasure because it's really easy for players to abuse this technique if they need, say, powdered gemstones for spell components. If you as a DM say you have a 500 gold piece bag of less valuable gems and players, you can dis decide what's in there. It can be really easy for your players to take you uh, literally at your word and say, well, some of the spell components that I'm going to need in the near future include a lot of powdered diamonds. So that's just going to be a 500 gold piece bag of nothing but small diamonds. Awesome. If you're really big on controlling access to things like that and making those items scarce, you may need to add some additional restrictions whenever you yield that narrative control and let players uh, define the treasure or at least a small part of the treasure that they're receiving. 
The fifth and final technique we're going to talk about here is including subtle nods to character backstories. As a DM, you may be doing this already, including little bits of treasure that point to or allude to different things in your character's backstories that will draw them in and, and give them future plot hooks and that kind of thing. But you don't have to make those plot hooks and subtle nods to character backstories so well defined. You can yield some of that narrative control to players by dropping in something that might be a part of their backstory and then allowing them to elaborate or not, depending on whether or not that's a part of their history they want to pursue in game. Say you've got a character who wrote in their backstory about their Aunt Bertha who raised them and and helped them survive on the streets even though she was in poverty and had very little herself. And maybe in a treasure hoard that your player uncovers sometime in the game, you reveal that one of the art objects that they find is actually a portrait painting of a lady who looks amazingly just like Aunt Bertha, except in this portrait, she doesn't look like she's in poverty. She's in the portrait with a gentleman, a, a prince. They're both decked out in, in wealthy clothing. But your Aunt Bertha never mentioned anything about being a royal. You do a double take because it looks so much like Aunt Bertha. But on closer inspection, do you think it could be? And instead of keeping that narrative control and saying, you know what, I've decided that your Aunt Bertha had this secret history as a noble who fell from grace and ended up in poverty and was living in secret because of some bad thing that happened. Your player can say, mm, nah, I don't think it was her. And then you give the player the control of their own backstory or whether or not there is a mystery in their backstory. When you as a DM think it might be cool to explore, your player may not, and that's okay. But if the player does want to explore that idea, you're giving them an opportunity to roll with it and add more detail and say, you know what, she did never talk about her childhood growing up. I never really noticed until now, but she was always super vague. And now I need to take this painting and go confront her about it or go find some other relatives that you didn't even know that you had and see why she fell from grace to begin with. So why would you want to use this technique at all? If I haven't made it clear earlier, it is a really cool tool to use when maybe you didn't have enough time to prep for your sessions and you want to unload a little bit of that responsibility on your players in a way that is collaborative and creative and gives them some ownership over the setting. You might also use it when you don't feel like your players are as invested as you want them to be and you want to nudge them in the right direction uh, and, and give them opportunities to be more invested and, and have more ownership over the story and the setting and, and where things are going in your campaign. What I hope is true for you, but that I know isn't true for all groups, is that your players are really collaborative and creative and really get into the opportunity to further develop your world. And you're using techniques like this to enhance that and, and feed into that strength of your group. And at that point, you don't really need any further convincing. The next time you've got a horde of loot that your players are going through, give them the opportunity to describe some of it themselves. You've come to the end of this chapter in your story, and you're finally going through the horde of the white dragon that you have slain, and you find a magical sword. How do you want to do this?